The war against the Nazis and Hitler was among the most justified conflicts in history. Yet, by the time the Allied victory had become inevitable, it had become clear that there were additional political goals, and for the USSR, it was the domination and control of Eastern Europe, both to serve as a potential buffer and to gain new allies. We're planning to cover the Sovietization of the Eastern Europe in detail, but in this video we'll talk about Poland as its transformation had begun before the end of the war and would play a crucial role in our story going forward. The Second World War in Europe began in 1939 when Nazi Germany invaded Poland. Despite a gallant and somewhat unexpected resistance by Polish forces, Poland's fate was sealed when 16 days after German forces crossed into Poland in the west, Soviet forces invaded from the east, fulfilling the secret terms of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Act that had been signed between the Soviet Union and Germany in late August. The Polish government fled to London and established itself there as the legitimate and globally recognized government in exile. The Poles throughout the war continued their resistance to their occupiers, both Nazi and Soviet, and then only Nazi after 1941, when the German invasion of the Soviet Union occurred. The resistance was carried out by various formal and irregular military organizations, of which the Home Army, or Armia Krajowa, AK, was the most prominent. The AK was firmly loyal to the London-based government in exile. The culmination of this resistance was the 1944 Warsaw Uprising, launched in August as Soviet forces neared the city. The uprising was brutally repressed by the Germans over the course of weeks and months as the Red Army held its positions, allowing the Germans to effectively destroy the AK as a fighting force. Stalin, aiming to take complete control over Poland, sponsored the establishment in 1944 of a new government in Poland, the Polish Committee of National Liberation more commonly known as the Lublin Committee. The Lublin Committee, set up as an alternative to the London Poles, was composed of Soviet-trained communists and backed by the Armia Ludowa, the People's Army, at anywhere from 15,000 to 60,000 men, depending on whose estimates are used. The People's Army was considerably smaller than the approximate 400,000 men of the AK. As the Soviet Union moved into Polish territory through 1944, it immediately began installing members of the Lublin Committee into power positions in the liberated territory. Despite the Soviet agreement that was made at the Yalta Conference, calling for free and unfettered elections in Poland, to allow the establishment of a government of national unity, the Sovietization of Poland was happening simultaneously with the expulsion of the Germans. The Lublin Committee began to issue its manifesto, which, in combination with the severe weakening of the AK after the Warsaw Uprising, helped increase the popularity of the Communists. The most notable change was the Land Reform Decree in September 1944, from which more than one million peasant Poles got land. At the same time, numerous factories in the newly liberated territory were taken over by workers, who created workers' councils, Soviets, to manage them. The Provisional Government, formally established in January 1945, was of course dominated by Communists, and was headed by Edvard Osobka Morawski. Non-leftists were shut out of the government and all security was being handled by the NKVD, the Soviet secret police. The government of Poland was made accountable to the unelected, Communist-dominated State National Council. The political landscape in Poland, as the war was ending, was dominated by the left and non-leftist forces were banned and persecuted. Only one prominent non-communist political force was allowed to operate, the Peasants' Party, headed by the former Prime Minister of the London Poles, Stanislav Mikolajczyk. Sixteen representatives of the Polish underground state, itself vehemently opposed to the Soviet occupation, were abducted by the NKVD and brought to Moscow where show trials were held. The group included the Commander-in-Chief of the Home Army, Leopold Okulski, and the former Deputy Prime Minister Jan Stanislaw Jankowski, as well as several other ranking representatives of the London Poles and the Polish underground state. Of the 16, 13 were sentenced to various terms of arrest, and some of those were allegedly murdered while serving their sentences. The first electoral test of the communist government in Poland came in 1946, with a referendum asking three questions. The first was if the people were in favor of abolishing the Senate. 
The second was if they agreed to the nationalization of industry and the consolidation of socialist economies. And the third question was if the Poles were in favor of the changes to their western border. The official results indicated that the Poles voted in favor of all three proposals. However, there were also serious allegations of widespread voter fraud. In Krakow, where the opposition managed to ensure a fair vote, the votes against the questions were 84%, 59%, and 30% for the three questions. This significantly differed from the official results, however, the objections of the opposition were simply ignored. The referendum led to industry being nationalized, the implementation of the state-led economy, and a unicameral SAM parliament. The next stage in the consolidation of power by the communists came during the 1947 parliamentary elections. The democratic bloc, led by the Soviet-trained Boleslav Beirut and his Workers' Party, faced off against the opposition People's Party, led by Mikolajcik. The campaign was marked by violence and persecution against the opposition. Over 80,000 members of the People's Party were arrested, mostly for false charges, in the month leading up to the election. Of these people, approximately 100 were murdered by this Polish secret police, the UBP. These actions, as well as widespread vote falsification on the day of the election, led to Beirut and the Democratic bloc winning 394 of the 434 seats in the SAM. Mikolajczyk only secured 28. The 1947 legislative elections ensured the total domination of Poland by the communists as Beirut was elected president, while Mikolajczyk and other opposition leaders fled the country as a result of further prosecution. The People's Party soon dissolved with the left wing of the party merging with the ruling Democratic bloc. The same fate awaited the Polish Socialist Party and several other smaller parties. What emerged was the Polish United Workers' Party, which then went on to control Poland for the next four decades. Only two other parties were allowed to function, but as they did not oppose the government, their sole purpose was to create the illusion of a multi-party system. At this time, Vladislav Gomulka was the head of the Communist Party, but was opposed to the Stalinist approach of rule, where the party was controlled by Moscow with very little independence. Gomulka was one of the architects of the Communist consolidation in Poland, and very much involved in the falsification of election results, and persecution of political opponents. He was very much a communist, but wanted to be able to make the specifics of Poland into consideration when creating policies. As a result of what amounted to an anti-Stalinist stance, he was ousted from the Communist Party, labeled a right-wing nationalist deviator, and arrested. Beirut took charge of the Communist Party. Repressions such as these were common against people or groups who were determined to be against the government direction and could even extend to members and factions of the ruling party. The Ministry of Public Security, MBP, and the Department of Security, UB, were the main tools of state repression. There are estimates that at one point there was one UB agent for every 800 Polish citizens. With the consolidation of communist power came the emergence of a new political and bureaucratic elite, the nomenklatura. Replacing the old political and economic elite, it was made up of the leaders of the Communist Party at both the central and regional levels, the heads of factories, industrial institutions, and top-ranking security and military officials. Nomenclatura were people considered ideologically reliable and enjoyed many privileges in exchange for the influence which they exerted in society. Poland, heavily damaged in the war years, embarked on a path of rapid reconstruction and industrialization. The three-year plan on reconstructing the economy was adopted in Poland to replace the 30% of production and infrastructure that was lost during the war. The plan was dedicated to finding a balance between the private sector, the public sector, and cooperatives, and did not emphasize an ideological approach. The aim was to rebuild the country and raise the living conditions of the Polish people. The plan was deemed a success in its ability as it helped rebuild industry, but fell short in meeting agricultural output targets as a result of attempts at collectivization. Large pieces of land were being taken away from their previous owners and divided between farmers and peasants. Although the government aimed for Soviet-style collective farms, 
This created a great deal of resentment among the peasants and farmers, and many simply continued to grow their own agricultural products. By the end of the three-year plan, agricultural output remained below pre-war levels. Industrialization, however, doubled its production between 1947 and 1950. There were fundamental changes in demographics happening at the same time. Over 1.8 million people moved into the cities, finding work in the booming industrial sector, as well as the reconstruction of the nation. Along with this, in line with agreements made at the Potsdam Conference, the ethnic German population that had been living in Poland was expelled west into Germany, while the ethnic Polish populations in Ukraine and Belarus were relocated into Poland. The success found in industrialization as a result of the emerging Soviet market for Polish products allowed Poland to increase its national outcome by the end of the 1940s. This happened despite the nationalization of all industry, private trade and enterprise. It also happened in the face of the refusal of Poland to partake in the Marshall Plan, the American-led plan for the rebuilding of Europe. This refusal was the direct result of pressure on Poland from Moscow. Poland by this time was rejecting the market economy and removing all remnants of democracy with the dissolution of opposition parties and the central planning office. By 1950, Poland had transitioned to a centrally planned state economy with Beirut and his Stalinists at the helm. A new six-year plan was launched at this time with an emphasis on heavy industry instead of the light consumer industry that had been the focus of the first three-year plan. As a result, despite the flourishing of heavy industry, the services and food industries suffered and one would expect the living standards of Poles began to fall. The Sovietization of Poland was a painful process for a country that had already suffered heavily during the war. The liberation from Nazi occupation had resulted in Soviet occupation and Poland subsequently became a Soviet satellite state. The ruling communist elite depended on the Soviet Union for its political and economic choices. Political competition was not allowed and opponents were persecuted, including the Catholic Church and the remaining intelligentsia that had survived the war. The policies adopted in Poland, which focused on rapid industrialization, were beneficial towards the rebuilding of the nation, but the focus on heavy industry, agricultural collectivization, and the refusal to participate in the Marshall Plan all ultimately harmed the Poles significantly. The Soviet-dependent communist regime would remain in control of Poland for the next four decades. The post-war period was a diplomatic mess, and the Sovietization of Poland proved that the world needed an international structure to deal with the current and potential future crises. And we'll discuss this more in future videos, so make sure you're subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We rely on our patrons to create these videos, so consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash the Cold War. This is the Cold War channel, and we will catch you on the next one.